Hey, welcome back. I'm in the studio with another basic cisgender white guy mansplaining video, this time on the myth of free markets and the rights favored economist, Milton Friedman. Understanding the free market is foundational to our podcast, and as many of you know, the show's nemesis is famed Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman from the Chicago School of Economics. We have a few names for him, like Uncle Poo Poo Pants, and other silly names to try and take the wind out of his pomposity. Now, it's a bit unfair because, well, he's dead. But before you judge me for picking on a dead guy, hear me out. I frequently made the case on the pod that Milton Friedman was one of the most destructive forces behind neoliberalism and that the past 50 years has truly belonged to him. There are so many symptoms of our failing capitalist experiment that have their roots in his work. And beneath it all was his unflinching faith and devotion to free markets. In his world, anything and everything could be improved or solved by simply letting the market handle it. Racism, not a problem. The free market could fix that. Poverty, please. Free market, baby. Authoritarianism, fascism, healthcare, education. There isn't a big ticket item in our society that the free market can't fix. But there's one fundamental flaw in this sweeping hypothesis. There's no such thing as the free market. Now, Uncle Poo Poo Pants is famous for saying there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I suppose there's truth to that. There's a cost to everything. But the underlying idea behind his economic and social theory is that everything in life can be reduced to a series of transactions. In a perfect world, it would be between two parties without interference. And typically, this interference in his mind was government regulation. We're gonna learn a lot more about this concept in our journey together, but it's important to understand the roots of his philosophy and what he was responding to. Over the past hundred years, there have been two broad economic periods of capitalism defined by two men. The first 50 years belonged to John Maynard Keynes. The next 50 years belonged to Friedman. But you can't explain one without explaining the other. So briefly, John Maynard Keynes is the namesake of his theory of economics called Keynesian economics. Now, he wouldn't have called it that, obviously, but he too was responding to something, right? So if Friedman was responding to Keynes, then what was Keynes responding to? The answer is two world wars and the Great Depression. Keynes cut his teeth in the First World War, where he developed theories on how nations could rebuild after such devastation. And it gave him enough credibility to be called upon when the Great Depression hit and the Second World War once again tore the world apart. His great innovation was with respect to both fiscal and monetary policy. See, he believed that governments could increase money supply, monetary policy, to run reasonable deficits during periods of recession or depression to put people to work through fiscal policy initiatives. It was a rebuke of the austerity politics that drove European republics, such as Germany, into a deep depression after the First Great War and the Great Depression that followed. He believed in the elasticity of money to undergird nation states to prevent starvation and anguish. The act of starving an economy by pulling back on money supply and welfare through austerity only served to exacerbate the situation. He calls this the paradox of thrift. The reason this was revolutionary at the time is that it was widely believed, and still is by many, that deficits were worse than the depression. Obviously, this is reductive, but you get the picture. At the close of the Second World War and during the incredible rise of the United States, which had financed the war through debt and created welfare reforms under FDR, Keynes reigned supreme in the field and was chosen to lead the Bretton Woods Conference, which helped usher in a new era of global monetary reform and fiscal policies that lasted through the middle of the 1970s. Now, we're going to cover Bretton Woods in another video, but that's Keynes in a nutshell, in his half of the last century. Then along came the 1970s. Bow chicka wow wow. This is where we witnessed the rise of Milton Friedman in the Chicago School of Economics, the place he hung his hat. The economists in the Chicago School had been developing theories since the late 1940s that refuted Keynesian economics in all forms of monetary stimulus and intervention. They believed that left alone, the markets would have cured the ills of the Depression and rebuilt nations without printing money and running deficits. In fact, they believed that the world would have recovered faster and better. But at the time, nobody really gave it a thought. And then, we experienced something in the United States that infected the global economy, stagflation. 
We're gonna cover this period separately as well, but essentially during this period, we experienced the dual shock of high inflation and high unemployment. And while it only lasted for a period of a few years, it upended everything that we thought we knew about markets and economies. Nothing was working. Now, Friedman had been saying for years that government regulations would ultimately kill the U.S. economy. And like a broken clock, eventually he appeared to be right. In 1964, he hitched his wagon to Barry Goldwater, who was running for president. And through Goldwater, he was able to test some of his theories in campaign form, even though eventually Goldwater thankfully did not become president. But Friedman planted important seeds into the minds of the Republican Party, which was struggling to combat the success of the FDR and LBJ social welfare reforms. The old tactics of segregation and racism were outmoded, so they needed a new language to promote their doctrine. Language happily adopted by Dick Nixon, that we now know as the Southern Strategy. Here, the seeds would be planted for the beginning of the neoliberal era, seeds that would begin to flourish a decade after Goldwater and Nixon, when another politician, an actor turned governor in California, started bringing Friedman's vision to life, saying things like, the government is responsible for high unemployment and inflation because it's too big. So that's a quick primer on the origin story of neoliberalism, but we have a lot of ground to cover. Remember to subscribe to the channel and get 3,500 of your friends to do the same. If you'd like to support UNFTR and our merry little band of progressive miscreants, go to unftr.com and buy our delicious, fair trade, organic, shade-grown, bird-friendly, native-roasted coffee in partnership with Native Coffee Traders. Supports the show, supports indigenous economic development, and it's frickin' delicious coffee. Until next time, here endeth the video.